Well, good morning, church. Uh, welcome to the third uh, and final installment of our sermon series that we began uh, four weeks ago. We took a little break last week during Easter, but our sermon series we've been going through is uh, Gifted for a Purpose. Today we'll be going into 1 Corinthians chapter 14, so if you want to turn to your Bibles there, we'll be there in just a moment. Uh, we'll be actually walking through all of chapter 14 together this morning, so we have quite a few uh, passages to go through. But I really feel that the, the, the purpose of this gathering today and this teaching is very important for each one of us to have uh, a, a clear understanding about um, the gift of tongues and prophecy, and that's what we'll be referring to and looking at this morning. Um, before we get too far into it, I do want to welcome all of our first-time guests. It's great to see new families and faces week after week, but I also want to welcome our returning family members. Uh, so can we welcome one another this morning, please? I do say welcome, and uh, welcome to the family, not just to the house, but welcome to the family. All right. I do want to start a recap of the things we've covered last uh, few weeks, just because we have uh, had a few weeks in between these things. So just to, to reference back to this, so the reason why we're looking at chapters 12, 13, and 14 of 1 Corinthians, because this is a teaching or a correction from the Apostle Paul to the Church of Corinth. The Church of Corinth had a bad or a, uh, a misunderstanding about what the purpose of uh, spiritual gifts were. Uh, they kind of seen them as a hierarchy, that one was above another gift. And what Paul was addressing here is says there's no hierarchy in the, in the, power, in the uh, kingdom of God. All the gifts are equally dis distributed and equally um, uh, needed uh, for their purposes. In week number one, we started looking at uh, how the church was really missing that mark. They were using their spiritual gifts almost as leverage, saying, well, my gift is this, so I'm better than you are in this area. Uh, and really that is not what the Word of God says anywhere within Scripture. Uh, there is no hierarchy whatsoever. Each gift, each gift now, has a specific role and position and functionality within the body. And all of these gifts work in conjunction with each other. They complement each other perfectly. Um, on that first Sunday, I gave you guys a homework assignment. Many of you guys fulfilled that homework assignment, which I really appreciate. And the homework assignment was very simple. I want those that have never uh, understood or grabbed a hold of what their spiritual gift was to begin to dive in and ask the Lord, Lord, show me what my spiritual gift is. And throughout that week, many of you guys came to me uh, following and said, you know what, the Lord revealed this to me, and I really appreciate that encouragement. The second side of that homework assignment was for those that knew their spiritual gift uh, to ask the Lord, am I fulfilling or am I utilizing my spiritual gift to the fullest capacity possible? And there's many areas of our lives that we could do better in, myself included, so I'm not casting stones here. Uh, so each one of us can um, just do better with our spiritual walk with Jesus Christ. The gifts, the talents, the abilities, the opportunities that God's given us, are we using them to the utmost ability that we have? Uh, so those are the things that we looked up and uh, looked at in, in the week number one. Week number two, we begin to unpack the 13th chapter of, uh, of 1 Corinthians, which is known as the love chapter. And we began that series or that, that, that uh, message there was 1 Corinthians 12, 27. This was the focal point of our entire message because what I did there is I brought our attention back to why all of this is taking place. Because he wants us to understand that we are the body of Jesus Christ. Each one of you guys that have given your heart to Jesus Christ is already part of the body. You don't have to fulfill a particular duty or function to become part of the body of Christ. The moment you said, Lord, forgive me for my sins, come into my heart and be my Savior, in that moment of time, you became part of the body of Christ. And that is so uplifting to each one of us that we have purpose, we have identity, but we also have a place to call our own. You know, as we're going through uh, that, that, uh, that message there, we're looking at how the church can show love to the community and the people around us in all different ways. You know, as first, first, I'm sorry, chapter 13 is often looked at as a love chapter and used only for a romantic kind of love or a relational kind of love. 
But that's not the way that, that Paul intended that. That's not what God says. He wants us to have the agape love, that universal love, that all-encompassing kind of love. And that's what we need to see in the church and for the church to have that same love for the community and the world. Amen? Amen. Amen. So now this morning we're going to be um, walking into this, um, this next part here of gifted for a purpose. And as I said earlier, we are going to be looking at the functionality and the purpose of the gifts of tongues and prophecy. Some of you guys in this room, I know that you come from different backgrounds, and maybe you've never really experienced that type of uh, gifting. You, maybe you've never experienced anyone speaking in tongues or a word of prophecy given throughout a church service. Um, some of you guys have had many oppor you know, opportunities to, to experience that, maybe for yourself even, and you feel very comfortable with this conversation. No matter where you're at in that spectrum, I do believe before you walk out of this room today, the Lord's going to reveal some things to you to help you understand the purpose, the functionality, and the importance of the spiritual gifts such as tongues and, and, and interpretation or prophecy. So this morning, I'm going to ask you to please stand with me for the reading of the Word of God. I'm going to begin in verse 1 of 1 Corinthians chapter 14. Today, I will be reading out of the New International Version. And if you do not have your Bibles, you can follow along with me on the screens to my left or right. Uh, and you can go along with that. If you're there, say amen. amen. Verse 1. Following the way of love and eagerly desire... The spiritual, uh, the, the I'm sorry, gifts of the spirit, especially prophecy. For anyone who speaks in a tongue does not speak to people, but to God. Indeed, no one understands them; they utter mysteries by the Spirit. But the one who prophesies speaks to the people for their strengthening, encouraging, and comfort. Anyone who speaks in a tongue edifies themselves. But the one who prophesies edifies the church. I would like each one of you to speak in tongues, but I would rather have you prophesy. The one who prophesies is greater than the one who speaks in tongues, unless someone interprets, so that the church may be edified. We'll stop there for just a moment and let's pray. Father, I just thank you for this word that you've given us. I'm thankful that you brought us to this section of, of Scripture, to bring clarification, to bring correction, to bring encouragement to our hearts. Lord, today, as your humble servant, I ask you to speak through me. And Lord, I pray that you open up the hearts, the ears, the minds, the lives of those that will be listening to this message. Let them hear your words speaking directly to them. So Father, we decrease here so that you may increase and abound in all ways. We thank you and we praise you. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You may be seated, church. Now again, a lot of what Paul has said here in the first bit of our chapter 14 may be a little bit confusing, almost like double talk. And it kind of con In some ways you may see it as a contradiction to the things that we've said back in chapter 12, but that's the reason we've gathered here today. It's to dive into the Word of God and look at it uh, in the context that it was written. So one of the things that is really important as we go through any time of Scripture, any time we're studying the Bible, is to keep th a few things in mind. Number one is who's the author? Now, not every single Scripture in, 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 in the Bible, we know exactly who wrote it or who spoke it. Uh, but in this particular one, we know exactly who wrote this chapter. So Paul, the Apostle Paul, or Saul, depending on which, uh, which language you want to speak there, is the author of this particular letter, and it was addressed to the church in Corinth. So we know the author, we know the receiver. Uh, so now the other thing we need to know about text, or the text here, is the intended purpose or what was going on behind the scenes to bring this letter about. So the one thing we always have to keep in mind throughout this entire day is this, this church was in disorder. This church had some confusion and some misunderstandings about what the Scripture says, about the Spirit of God, the functionality of the Spirit of God, the, the, the differences between spiritual gifts. And this is what Paul is addressing as a corporate body. It's important for us to understand that we're talking about corporate worship here, not an individual personal relationship with Jesus Christ. This is in a corporate setting much like we have here going on today. 
So here's what Paul is saying. During corporate church services, okay, it's better to have a prophecy spoken than, wor um, than words that are not understandable, such as tongues. It is so important for us to understand that what Paul is saying, he's not saying one is better than the other in the overall scheme of things. But he's talking about in the functionality in a church service, he would rather have people walking out of the room knowing exactly what the Lord said than they're going, I wonder what that was all about. I don't speak that particular language. So is there a purpose and plan for every single part of this? Absolutely. God does not give us meaningless gifts. He doesn't give us bad gifts. He's a, a, the father of the heaven and lights. He gives good gifts to his children. And one of the first things I guess we need to do before we go too much further, and I did not do this earlier, is define tongues. What is tongues to start with? So the word tongue is just another way of saying uh, a, a language. Okay? As of right this second, I am speaking to you in the English language. This is my native tongue. Um, I may not be doing it very well, but this is the best I got, okay? But this is my English speaking to you. Uh, some of you guys in the room may speak multiple different languages. You have many tongues that you can speak. I have one. I'm not even good at pig Latin, so I'm not even going to say that one. This is the best one that I have. But most of you guys in this room understand the words that are coming out of my mouth because you also hear and understand English. That is a tongue. So when we say the word tongue, just understand it means language and nothing more than just that. It's just a fancy way of saying this. So you might be wondering right now, why does God give people gifts to speak in a language that they don't understand, they don't speak, and no one else understands around them? Why would God give that particular gift uh, to a person? Well, he's answered this question already in verse 2 uh, as kind of the, the beginning point of why the gift of tongue is given us. So in verse 2, we can go back there for just a moment. It says, for anyone who speaks in a tongue does not speak to people but to God. So we know right out the gate that the reason that God's given us this tongue is not to speak to one another. It's to speak to God, to talk to him in the spirit um, when we're talking to him. Because it says they utter mysteries by the spirit. So when we think of tongues, I want you to think of it in the same way as you would prayer, okay? When I pray, I don't pray to you. I may pray for you to God. The address to the, my prayer is not to you. It is always going up. Our gift of tongues is the same way. I'm not praying in tongues to you. I'm praying in tongues to God. And I have no idea what God's saying, but it's, it's building up the spirit is what it's doing. So when we're starting to understand the purpose and the functionality of the spiritual gifts, it really puts things in the right perspective and understanding throughout the whole thing. Now the purpose of behind tongues, so we know the direction of tongues is going up. Now the purpose of tongues can be, has been revealed to us in the first half of verse 4. I want you to go back there for just a moment. So that first half of verse 4, it says, Anyone who speaks in a tongue edifies themselves. So there's the functionality of the, of the tongues, is to edify themselves. You might be sitting here right now going, well, that's pretty selfish. Why would you want to do anything that just builds up yourself, Pastor? That sounds very, very, you know, pompous. Well, let me ask you this question, okay? When you read your Bible, does that edify me? And I could read my Bible for the next 20 years, and that won't be, do a thing for your life. It'll do a lot for me, but it'll do nothing for you. So is reading the Bible selfish? Is me praying in my prayer closet, is that selfish? No. Me worshiping God, is that selfish because it's me and God's time? No. The same as praying in the Spirit is not selfish, even though it's designed just to build up myself in that aspect. It's edifying, the body, and edifying is just another fancy way of saying built up, okay? So I don't want anybody misunderstanding what I'm saying here. So when we're looking at the functionality of the, of the of speaking in tongues, it edifies themselves. But then we're all looking at the second half of that verse, and it begins to talk about prophecy. Now watch this now. The second half says, but the one who prophesies edifies the church. So half of, half of what we're talking about today is talking about ourselves. The other half is talking about the church. And what's the problem that, that Paul's addressing here? He's talking about functionalities and problems within the church body. So the problem that the, the church of uh, uh, let's say Ephesus, of uh, Corinth was having 
was they were all the, using their spiritual gifts, not knowing that they're supposed to be building up one another in a church setting. So we had a bunch of different people just standing up and speaking in tongues for absolutely no reason because there's no answer or no um, edification to the body after that. And so we're going to look at these things. Uh, and I really appreciate that Paul doesn't just stop there with his two verses, you know. Um, but he actually goes in a lot further explaining to what he is saying here in greater detail. And we're going to pick up through this an entire chapter here. So we'll look at verse 6 for just a moment. We're going to read verses 6 through 12. And we're going to walk through this almost like a Bible study today. Because, you know what, I really see a lot of value in the, in the Word of God. Uh, when the church begins to deviate away from the Word of God and inject pastors' opinions only, that's the reason we got a mess that we have right now going on in the world. We have too many opinions and not enough facts. My opinions don't matter. I don't care what your, what your opinion is on that one. Opinions don't matter when compared to the Word of God. All right? I love you, but I'm going to hold true to the Word of God. Amen? Now, verse 6 starts out with, Now, brothers and sisters, I come to you, I'm sorry, if I come to you and speak in tongues, what good will it be to you unless I bring some revelation or knowledge or prophecy or word of instruction? So there's the question. What good is it for me to be able to speak in tongues to everybody if you have no idea what I'm saying in a corporate setting? Remember, all of those things is talking about in a corporate setting. Verse 7. Even in the case of lifeless things that make sounds, such as a pipe or harp, how will anyone know what tune is being played unless there is distinction in the notes? Again, if the trumpet does not, make a, does not sound a clearer call, who will get ready for battle? So it is with you. Unless you speak intelligibly word, intelligible words with your tongue, how will anyone know what you're saying? You will just be speaking into the air. Verse 10. Undoubtedly, there are all sorts of languages in the world, not, yet none of them is without meaning. If then I do not grasp the meaning of what someone is saying, I am a foreigner to the speaker, and the speaker is a foreigner to me. So it is with you. Since you are eager for the gifts of the Spirit, try to excel in those that build up the church. The last line in that passage there is the key to unlocking the essence of what Paul has been saying for all of these chapters, all these verses that we've gone through, all of these teachings comes back to this one verse right here saying, if you want to build up the spirit, you want to build up the church, try to use the gifts in the church setting that's going to help everybody else. Now, not that those other gifts are not have their own purpose and plans, but right here he's addressing issues within that church body. And I, and I appreciate that he does bring that in there to build up the church. So what is the purpose of prophecy? It's to build up the church. And, and it really makes perfect sense when we start breaking things down about why God gives us these gifts and how they're supposed to function. Because then you can see things working in perfect unity with one another. So the same thing happens um, to us today. This gift did not go away because the apostles or the disciples died. The gifts of tongues and interpretation or prophecy are still alive and well now as we sit here. Now in our church, you may not see it very often, but it will happen. So a lot of what we're teaching here today is to bring you um, understanding and revelation. So when these things take place, you're not caught off guard. You're not walking out of this room going, well, that was weird. Now you understand what is going on. And there's some specific details that Paul is going to address about how these gifts need to be utilized within a church setting. And it's important for us to understand there are, um, we'll say, rules of engagement, things that we should be looking for as markers to tell us if this is disorder or if it's order. Verse 13 tells us this, For this reason, the one who speaks in a tongue should pray that they may be, interpret what they say. It's important for us to know that what, we are, what someone is saying is exactly what we need to hear because how are you going to say amen to something you don't understand? Here's a case in point. So many years ago, I was on the phone or a Skype call. I forget what it was. I remember talking to Felix, Ivedros, and a few other ones from Uganda. They, uh, they speak English very well, honestly, um, but during this phone call, uh, Ivedros says, hey, pastor, is it okay if I pray as we close here? And he goes, I'll pray in Swahili, which is their native language. I said, go for it. That sounds cool. 
Uh, so he, wonderful, powerful prayer. I mean, just like you know that he was believing and feeling everything he was saying in Swahili. So at the end of the call, you know, after the end of the prayer, rather, he says, you know, amen, and I'm just sitting there. I don't say amen at the end of the prayer. And because I don't, I, how am I supposed to agree to something that I don't have no idea what he's saying, you know? I don't think he was a witch doctor. I still don't think he's a witch doctor. And, but who knows what he was saying over me or in that, in, that, in that room there. So how am I supposed to say amen to something that I don't know what's being said? Tongues is the same way. How are you going to be in agreement with something that you don't understand what's going on? In a church setting, okay? And this is what we're talking about. In a church setting, now if he was prayed in English and I understood everything he said, I said, amen, praise God, brother. But the thing is, he caught that. The next phone call, he noticed that I did not say amen at the end. He goes, I'm sorry for praying in Swahili. He goes, from now on when we pray, we're going to pray together in English. I said, I appreciate that. I didn't correct him, but the Holy Spirit revealed it to him going, how's this guy going to say amen to something he doesn't understand? Praise God for the sensitivity of the Spirit with other people, amen? amen. So this is what we need to keep in, in mind with it, as we're referring to public speaking of tongues. Now, there's a private speaking of tongues that we're not going to address today. This is all public speaking of tongues that we're, that we're talking about. We need to know that there is a purpose and a functionality behind all of these different things. And I am well-versed, um, I'm well-established, rather, um, being uh, from a charismatic background. It doesn't freak me out. It doesn't make me off base when I hear people speak in tongues, pray in tongues, cry in tongues, sing in tongues, speak in prophecy. All these different things don't freak me out because I know that they're real at times. And I have to use that in, in context because there's also been some church services that I've attended, not my own church service, but other churches that I've attended as a visitor. And I'm going to just tell you right now, they were wacky. They were off base. They were not biblically correct because it was chaos. See, God's not a God of confusion. He's not a God of chaos. He's a God of order, not disorder. And we're going to look at more of that in just a moment. So it's important for us to, to evaluate what we see going on in the church service against the Word of God, not our feelings. Sometimes our emotions overtake the, the real Word of God here. Verses 22 through 25 Paul is continuing to give this explanation of the purpose of tongues and prophecy to the church. And this is a larger chunk there, but I want you guys to follow along with me because it's so important to have the full context of what's being spoken here in chapter 14. Beginning with verse 22, it says, Tongues then are a sign not for believers but for unbelievers. Prophecy, however, is not for the unbelievers but for believers. So if the whole church comes together and everyone speaks in tongues and, inqui and uh, inquires uh, or unbelievers come in, will they not say that you're out of your mind? But if an unbeliever or an inquirer comes in while everyone is prophesying, they are convicted of sin and brought under judgment by all, as the secrets of their hearts are laid bare. So they will fall down and worship God, exclaiming, God is really among you. Now, this is another very kind of confusing passage because it says one thing, and it seems like it almost contradicts the other one that says it's for unbelievers, but then later it says the prophecy is what they need. So what is Paul truly saying here? So we have to slow it down just a little bit and remember the purpose behind all of these things that Paul's talking about is to bring um, correct understanding within a church body. Their church was in dysfunction, disunity, and disarray. And he was bringing order back into, or from the disorder. So here what Paul is addressing is the problems going on here. And the, and the Corinthians here were all using their, their, their spiritual gifts publicly. Everybody was just using their gifts willy-nilly. And they had no real structure to it. They had no real understanding of it. Now part of that is they were a young church. That's the other side of this whole equation. We need to know where they're at in the timeline of things. The church is just now beginning to emerge. They start learning about these things for the first time. And there's many times I see people with uh, new spiritual gifts, things that God just unveiled, you know, revealed to them, and they know the gift is real. I know their gift is real, but they have no real um, control or use of it because they're using it 
um, improperly. We'll put it that way. I, I think of it, uh, and this is, a, this, just forgive me, okay, this is how my mind works. I look at it a lot like a brand new baby elephant who has the trunk. It's a real trunk, but that thing's just going every which way. It really doesn't know what it's supposed to do with it until it gets older and more wiser and goes, oh, I can pick out leaves, I can squirt water in my mouth. It's a very helpful thing to have sometimes for us, but we don't have a trunk, okay? Again, moving on, sorry. <laughs> you got to help me, man. Sometimes you got to pray for Pastor. He gets out there in the weeds sometimes. But sometimes churches have this brand new trunk and have no idea what to do with it. And this is where we need to go back to the Word of God and say, God, teach me how to use my gift properly. And that's the whole issue. They had the real gift. I'm not doubting that they were faking it. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is they didn't know how to use it properly. So Paul here is addressing to them saying, you know what? Here's the issues. You need to use it in this context and this time but also followed up with these instructions or these words of prophecy. All of these things have a place and a purpose. And I will say once again, when things are out of order, it does get weird. Myself included say, you know what? I don't want nothing to do with that because it's disorderly. Can people fake it? Oh, yeah. Yeah, they love to fake it, especially if it's bringing attention to themselves. And there's other churches or other people out there that will use the gifts however they want and say, this is how we are. They can just get over it or get used to it. Who cares what people think? Well, one big problem with that, that's not how God sees it. God does care how people think and how they feel because they don't want, he doesn't want anyone walking out of a church service going, I'm never going back to church again. That was just weird. There are places where tongues are utilized, and there's places where tongues are out of place. We need clear teaching on what the time and purpose of them are. See, here in verses 22 through 25, what Paul is saying here is, is tongue is given as a sign for the unbeliever. Use that, understand the word sign for just a moment, sign. What does a sign do? It points us to something or someone else. It explains something to us, okay? We have exit signs we have uh, in this room, so you know that that's the direction for the exit. You know there's a door nearby or a direction out for this part of it. Here, the sign is given to the unbelievers going, something's going on. I need to understand what's going on here. And this is where the prophecy comes in behind that or the fulfillment or the interpretation of that needs to take place because if there's no if there's a sign but no explanation they have no idea what it's supposed to mean a few years ago um there's a book that came out several years ago probably now um a book called charisma versus Chris, uh, charismania maybe you guys have read this thing it's by chuck uh, patrick chuck smith throughout that book uh he shared a story about his own church service he says one day that at the near the close of the service he asked a, a lady to begin to worship in tongues. He knew that lady could worship in tongues. Uh, he said that her uh, spiritual language will sound a lot like French. He doesn't speak French, so he sounded, sounded like French. He said, would you mind worshiping in your tongue right now? So she began to worship. And a few moments after she concluded the worship, uh, his wife, the pastor's wife, stood up and gave the interpretation. This astounded the pastor because he knows that that woman doesn't speak French and that woman, has his wife, doesn't speak French either. There's no way she would know what she's saying. And it was just amazing for this thing to play out. Well, they concluded the service and it was about time to go home. Uh, after the service was over with, a visitor uh, was introduced to him. So another guy brought this lady over to him and says, Pastor, uh, I want to know more about the church, but before we get into all of that, what was that all about? What was up with that lady speaking French and the other lady interpreting? The pastor goes, would you believe that neither one of those women speak French? And she, she was like, mm, what's that about? She goes, that was a gift of the Holy Spirit. That, and she, he took her back to Scripture and said, this is how the gift of the Spirit works. She spoke in a tongue that she doesn't know. She gave the interpretation that she didn't understand from the very beginning, but she gave a perfect interpretation of it. The lady then went on to tell the pastor that she says, I, I lived in France for four years, and that woman that spoke 
spoke perfect French in, the, in, in a, uh, a, a dialect, um, uh, aristocratic dialect of, Fran of French. She said she was spot on with, with everything that's there. And she said the lady that gave the interpretation, spotless, perfect, exactly what it meant. So that right there opened her eyes to what God was saying to her in that moment. And during that conversation, she says, I need to know this God and gave her heart to Jesus Christ. This is the perfect functionality of what's going on within the church setting because God can speak through people in a public setting through tongues. Now, another example of this I heard from, uh, from, um, from Perry Stone many years ago that there was a church service. I want to say it was in Texas also, but I could not be ranked. Don't hold me to that one. There was a, a really rough guy, um, one of the, the town, the roughest guy in town, came in and sat in the sanctuary. As they sat there, uh, a young girl, a little girl, began to speak in tongues. And it sounded like a Native American tongue is what it sounds like. And at the end of the service, you know, there, there was an uh, interpretation and all of these different things. But really what, what she was saying in that tongue was repent, repent, repent. Now the thing is, that guy that came in through that door, he spoke that language. He heard repent, repent, repent in his native language. And he, the pastor says he bolted out of his chair and dove at the altar repenting. This is what God can do when churches are in order and using the gifts of the Holy Spirit. God is not a, a spirit of, of confusion or fear or dread. God wants to reveal himself in a powerful manner. And each one of you guys, remember a couple weeks ago, four weeks ago, I told you guys to begin to ask God what your spiritual gift is. What are your spiritual gifts? It may not just be one, it may be multiple. I don't have the gift of tongues and an interpretation. I've never had that. I have a gift of prophecy in private settings. I don't know if I've ever prophesied publicly at all. I could be wrong on that. But we all have different gifts that God wants to utilize for the, distinction, or for, for the kingdom of God. And that's including each one of you guys. And that what I'm talking about today may put you off a little bit going, well, this is just new, weird, and stuff to me that I don't understand. That's fine. As I said in, in the opening part of our, of our lesson, like two, four weeks ago, when things are new, it is a little weird at first. But after you understand, you realize, okay, this is actually not weird. It just was, I was uneducated with those things. Now, I know I didn't spend any time today talking about your personal prayer language with God. I'm praying that God will let me do that in another time because I think it's very important to have your personal prayer language in tongues. That one I believe that everyone can have. I do believe that. Um, but we'll talk more about that at another time here because this series that we're going through right now is addressing problems within the church of Corinth, which was absolutely in confusion. Verse 33 of chapter 14 here I want us to focus in on for just a moment. If you have your pens and highlighters ready, I want you to underline at least a couple words out of this passage. It says, For God is not a God of disorder, but of peace. As the congregations of the Lord's people. Remember, he's talking about within the church function, God is a God of order. He's a God of peace, not disorder. So if you underline the words disorder and peace in your Bibles, just so you understand that what God is trying to be speaking to you here today. I believe this one verse here summarizes everything else. It really does. It sums up the confusion within the church. It summarizes up uh, the problems, uh, the disorder, the confusion, brings everything back into balance. See, I believe that God is a very uh, balanced God. He's not a God of disorder or dysfunction. And what I really see going on within the church community is instead of staying even keeled, we swing to one extreme or the other within our uh, within that gamut there. And that pendulum swinging too far one way or the other is a very dangerous place for the church to be in. The one side of the pendulum can swing all the way to the place that says, you know what, there's no gifts anymore. The Holy Spirit left because the disciples died. Well, that doesn't line up with Scripture. It doesn't even line up with what I've known from my own personal life without Scripture. But my life and Scripture line up perfectly. I know the gifts of the Holy Spirit are alive and well. So that, edge of the, that end of the pendulum is completely bonkers. It's wrong. But here's the problem. That pendulum can swing all the way to the other side and says, hey, let's just be all frilly-nilly and just do whatever we want to do and just be dysfunctional and chaotic. 
Well, that equally is as dangerous as not having gifts at all because if you're not using them properly, people are going to get hurt. People are going to be confused and put off by the church and by the Spirit of God because they don't understand what's going on. It's important for us to find that balance of there going to say, God, show us what that perfect order and peace looks like for us. And that's where I see Paul trying to bring the church of Corinth back into focus, saying, don't swing one way, don't swing the other way. Stay right there in the middle where the Lord is at. Because here's the greatest thing. As we go through scriptures, as you go through your walk of faith, you recognize that uh, the, the Spirit of God is, is, a, is a perfect gentleman. The Holy Spirit is a perfect gentleman. He's not going to make you feel uncomfortable or weirded out or just like, you know what, I don't want nothing to do with that. He's going to show us that peaceful experience with Him. So church, we need to see these things in our own lives every single day. God fulfills Scripture. We need to start reading them. i got a few more things that I want to read with you guys before we dismiss here. This is going to be verse 34. Verse 34 says, Women should, should remain silent in the churches. They are not allowed to speak, but must be submissive, as the law says. All right, church dismissed. Good night. <laughs> Just kidding. No. Unfortunately, there's some churches that stop right there. That tell the women to be still and silent and don't say a word. There's a time and place for everything. I'll give you that. We need to recognize, going back, what is this verse talking about? What is, the, what is Paul speaking to us throughout this entire message? So, taking this verse all by itself in a completely different chapter, yeah, that would be a little weird. But why did Paul say women should be remain silent in the churches and they're not allowed to speak? Is that always? Nope. There's a problem going on. He's addressing some issues here. One of the things we need to understand is history. History is going to teach us a whole lot of different things. Because at the beginning here, we know that we're talking about the church of Corinth, a new church. Now, churches would look a lot like the synagogue settings. So in the synagogue, in the Jewish faith, women would sit on one side, men would sit on the other. I don't know which side, that neither here nor there. But they would sit segregated in there. So it's important for us to understand that, before we get into verse 35, which is a further explanation of what he was saying there. Verse 35 says, If they want to inquire, come on the women, if they want to inquire about something, they should ask their own husbands, where? At home. For it is disrespectful for a woman to speak in the church. Here's what's going on. Gladys is sitting over here. Frank is sitting over here. And Gladys goes, hey, Frank, what was he saying? And Frank's like, shh. Read the verse. Women don't speak. That's what he's talking about. Women were shouting across the aisle trying to figure out what was being said from the pulpit. And it was causing dysfunction and confusion. This whole chapter is talking about confusion and disorder in the church. He's not saying you can never speak. He's just saying, not while the pastor's preaching or speaking or preaching. Ask the husband at home, what does that mean? Dig in deeper at home. All these different things. And this is where husband, the role of husbands and fathers are really amplified. So husbands, fathers, males, listen up to me real quick. Even if you're not a, a husband yet, um, I want you to hear this very important message, okay? You guys are the priest of your own home. You have a role and responsibility within your own home to lead your families. The reason we see the world collapsing the way we have because we've lost the male role models within the church and within the home and within the community. I believe in you men. I believe you have the power, the ability, and the authority to speak truth to your wives and your children. But you also have a responsibility to walk in righteousness. When we start deviating from the word of God, that's when things get out of whack. That's when things get chaotic. That's when families fall apart, communities collapse, and the churches get empty. God gave us a template, a guidebook and a blueprint to follow, and it begins with a male leadership. So women, talk to your husbands at home. Let's do a Bible study at your kitchen table. 
let's turn off the, the TV long enough, let's close the laptops and turn off the phones and actually open the Word of God and lead our families the way they should be led. Amen? Amen. Men, I believe in you. And it, the, the, world, the world may tell you to shut up and sit down and be quiet. The Word of God tells you otherwise. He says, stand up and speak and preach and walk your life out accordingly, right? Women, am I lying right now? Do you guys agree with what I'm saying to you? The men are needed to stand up and fight, right? And lead. I love how Paul closes out this portion of the letter. And he recaps everything that he's talked about in the last three chapters so perfectly. And I really appreciate about that. We're going to look at verse 39 and 40 as we close here today. It says, Therefore, my brothers and sisters, be eager to prophesy, and do not forbid speaking in tongues. But watch this now. But everyone, I'm sorry, everything should be done in a fitting and orderly way. What a great way of summing up everything that Paul has been saying for three straight chapters. So church, let's take this right here to heart. Let's embrace the gifts that God has given us. Uh, let's look for ways to work with these gifts uh, and, and intertwine with one another. Let's continue to be the body of Jesus Christ the way we were designed to be and we were called to be. Let's do this in an orderly and edifying manner. We can do this, church. We have the perfect guidebook to follow along with. Let's crack this thing open, live our lives by it, and give God all the glory. Amen? Amen. Let me to pray.